right, welcome everybody to our November 2023 uh, CLFBC webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Roberto, and I'm the director of the Zero Emissions Building Exchange, or ZEBEX, uh, BC's decarbonization hub for the building sector. And for now, while we recruit our uh, CLFBC program manager, I'm also filling in for that role. Um, I will start the webinar by acknowledging uh, that Many of us, myself included, live and work on the traditional unceded territories of the First Nations. And I am coming to you from the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth First Nations territory. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Forestry Innovation Investment for the financial support of CLFBC really since like April of 2022. We are making an audio recording, uh, sorry, a video recording of this webinar to add it to the very long list or lineup of uh, videos on the CLFBC YouTube channel. You should check out that channel, uh, which you can also access via the CLFBC website's resource page. Um, this is why we ask that you keep your audio muted while Zara and Anthony are presenting. Um, for the Q&A segments, we'll have some Q&A segments. Uh, you can either use the chat or you can put up your virtual hand and just ask your question outright. Uh, if you do that, bonus, uh, you'll be in the recording. So CLFBC was originally established as the Embodied Carbon Network Vancouver back in 2019 uh, by Anthony. And then it became CLF Vancouver, uh, which was the world's first regional hub of the Carbon Leadership Forum mothership, I guess, uh, out of the University of Washington. And then it was adopted by Zebex in 2022, just when Zebex was adopted by the Zero Emissions Innovation Center or Zeek. Uh, CLF Vancouver was, uh, it was adopted as a center of excellence for BC, which made it Canada's first center of excellence for embodied carbon. Uh, now CLF BC is a program of Zeek alongside Zebex and, uh, and B2E. If you wanna learn more about um, CLF BC, you can visit clfbritishcolumbia.com, like you see here on your screen. Uh, it's got lots of resources, mainly videos, uh, but also including three recent case studies you see here to help you achieve, I would say, cost-effective embodied carbon reductions in all buildings. These are part nine uh, case studies. We're working on some um, part three case studies right now. Uh, when we adopted CLFPC last year, there were no bylaws or regulations in place to limit embodied carbon uh, in BC's buildings. But regardless, uh, we knew that embodied carbon was an important piece of, deep, of building decarbonization. And I'd say there was an, and remains to this day a growing interest and an awareness of the impact embodied carbon has on our climate. Um, but a year and a half ago, all of Canada's 2030 and 2050 targets didn't actually include embodied carbon, only operational emissions, with uh, a notable exception, of course, no surprise here. In November of 2020, the city of Vancouver's um, uh, city council approved the Climate Emergency Action Plan. And, um, and it includes a goal of reducing embodied carbon in new buildings by 40% relative to 2018 levels. And uh, the regulations to achieve that have started rolling out after, I'd say, pretty extensive industry consultation. And those regulations include supporting guidance like, like what we're here to talk about today, which is the Vancouver Embodied Carbon um, Guidelines. As an aside, that industry feedback was collected. Some of that industry feedback was actually collected at one of these CLFBC webinars back in uh, this past January. And another quick side note, uh, here is that Metro Vancouver Regional District and Whistler also have an identical target of 40%. Metro Van doesn't actually issue building permits, uh, as many of you know, or set requirements for new buildings like thou shalt built to emissions level three of the zero carbon step code. But they frame themselves in their climate 2050 roadmap for buildings as an enabler or supporter uh, for local governments that are part of Metro Van to achieve that 40% reduction in embodied carbon by 2030. And I'm gonna assume here that the goal has made its way into how Metro Vancouver uh, housing builds new housing projects. So um, 
how important is embodied carbon in new construction? I'll take you back to um, another CLFBC webinar from August of 2022, which coincidentally also featured Zara and Anthony. On a provincial scale uh, and on an annual basis, this is more or less what it looks like. Uh, on the right, the percentages represent more of the building. So not just the building structure and envelope, but also the interior mechanical and electrical systems. And notably, uh, it also includes refrigerant leakage, which um, I think the city of Vancouver may be including in their upcoming operational uh, emissions limits. Uh, Zara can clarify that for me. So, so just under half of the emissions from new construction in BC comes from uh, embodied carbon. To hammer this home um, at a building level, using a benchmarking study that was done, that was prepared by the City of Nelson, Three West Building Energy Consultants and Builders for Climate Action. Uh, this was last year. This is the comparison between upfront embodied carbon. So stages A1 to A3, so not the full life cycle, uh, but those stages do actually represent like three quarters-ish of the total life cycle emissions. So a comparison between upfront embodied carbon and the operational emissions for a home that, you know, if you do the right thing, it's built as an all electric home and energy efficient home. It would take over 200 years for the operational emissions to match the upfront embodied carbon um, of that home. So for a home that uses gas, obviously, that, you know, for space heating and domestic hot water, it's, it's a lot less. It's just over 20 years. So if you want more insight into uh, this than just one slide, uh, check out the January 2022 uh, Decarb Lunch slides on zebex.org uh, or the podcast on Zebex's resource page uh, or Spotify and Apple podcast channels. The City of Nelson also has this uh, report on their website. So in a nutshell, that's how important embodied carbon is for buildings and their contribution to climate change. And that's why we really should be including embodied carbon in 2030 and 2050 targets. So uh, while you're filling out the first of two anonymous polls, this is our audience profile poll, I'd like to pass it over to Zara Tejnizi, the City of Vancouver's Senior Planner for Embodied Carbon. Thank you, Roberto. Um, should I give some time to the- No, you, you can proceed. To fill the poll? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, let's share my screen. Do you see my presenter? Like the yes, I do. All okay. good. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, thanks everyone for being here. I'm very excited today to share the work that we have been doing on these guidelines with your input, and then have some more discussion on it. So uh, I am going to get started by. Um, Um, so just just ju just a quick overview of the agenda for today. Actually, Roberto gave us a little bit of a context, so I'm going to jump over the context that some of that seems to have a little bit of over overlap with what Roberto presented. Then I'm going to walk you through the big picture of what these guidelines contain, um, uh, and then a little bit about the sufficient requirements. Then we'll have a question and answer uh, in between to answer any questions that may came up till that part. And then I'll hand it over to Anthony to talk about um, more in depth about the assumptions, the modeling uh, um, requirements, the baseline setting and data collection, uh, which again, like I'll just um, broadly talk over, talk about them, but Anthony will just dive deeper into that. And then we'll have a quick um, chat about what are the next steps for us and what's happening um, elsewhere uh, in the realm of policy and regulation for embodied carbon. Um, so 
As for the context, uh, Roberta mentioned, so city of Vancouver declared climate emergency and as to respond to that, we developed our climate emergency action plan in 2020, which basically has six big moves that can help us achieve uh, or address the climate emergency. And one of those uh, six moves are uh, is uh, low carbon materials and construction practices, which is basically addressing embodied carbon in, in our buildings in the city. Um, um, and, and, and the target for that is to reduce embodied carbon from all new buildings um, in Vancouver by 40% by 2030, uh, and to uh, set the pathway to get there, we basically also develop a, an embodied carbon strategy, which sets our vision and pathway to get where we are um, aiming to, to go. Um, so um, one of the, I mean, a city of Vancouver actually had have been asking for embodied carbon reporting for all of our rezoning projects uh, since 2017. But uh, the big first step after developing this strategy and setting the target um, of the 40% reduction was updating our code. So um, we basically started uh, requiring embodied carbon reporting for all part three buildings uh, starting October, 2023. Uh, so not only rezoning, and then we also started by uh, setting a limit. The limit for that that is in effect right now is quite easy to achieve. And the aim for that is to allow the industry to build capacity and, and be prepared for the upcoming update. So right now we are saying that the limit is less than double of a baseline. And um, the whole point of these guidelines and the reporting requirements is to make sure that we have a consistent approach to assessing and also setting that baseline. So we make sure that that these, these projects are doing this a, a comparable assessment. And then moving to 2025, we have uh, some uh, proposed changes that is approved by city council in principle, but we we will take the details to council next year. And um, if approved, uh, that's going to be updated at the beginning of January 2025. And that would be basically a more stringent target. So uh, we will we will set, um, or what we have for now is setting a 20% reduction uh, for um, the lower rise building up to 60 story that can be built with wood and 10% reduction for all other buildings. And in addition to that, we have um, a set of uh, responsible material criteria, which basically aims to address other aspects of uh, responsible material sourcing, which may not directly be uh, shown in uh, embodied carbon assessment, at least at the moment with the tools that we have. And we are asking projects to meet at least one of um, these three requirements that we are setting, which is uh, basically, again, like uh, sustainable material source Thing like uh, certified wood, for example, uh, or wood from indigenous forests. We have healthy and transparent materials, so the supply chain, and then we also have circular materials. And if projects don't meet any of these, then they have to double the reduction. Um, this is how the code language looks like now. So it's basically a new section added to the section 10 of the Vancouver Building Bylaw, which basically says the same thing that I mentioned, the, the, the reporting requirement and a, a, and a below two times limit of the baseline. Um, and uh, yeah, so we also recently released the guidelines and also a, a standardized design report, which are available on our website. Uh, and the guidelines uh, basically include um, um, what are the compliance pathways that we accept, uh, how to define the whole building LCA scope uh, when we assess uh, the compliance. Um, we also uh, have a standardized methodologies and assumptions where there is um, when, where there is um, maybe not project specific data there. So, so making sure that the assumptions are consistent and relevant to our region, uh, setting the baseline and also standardized documentation and submittals, which is going to be quite key given that um, from 2017 we have been collecting data and we realized that it is very crucial to have um, 
a certain uh, level of detail to be able to assess the compliance, but also be able to use that data to improve policy in future. And then I mentioned we also have a design report. I'll, I'll show it later on. So it's basically an Excel sheet that uh, simplifies and standardizes the reporting. Uh, but in addition to that, we set additional data collection requirements um, that's basically we are asking for submission of raw data from the whole building LCA tools instead of asking applicants to break down the data after they get the export. And that way we reduce the load on them, but we also make sure that the data and the details are there for, for, a, for, a, um, ex for an acceptable quality control and future improvement. Um, and again, it also, it also simplifies the review process internally for us, which um, I also will talk about that a little bit more. Um, so uh, jumping on to just taking a look at the guidelines and the design report and what they entail. Um, as I mentioned, so the first thing is compliance pathways. Um, we have now two compliance pathways. One is an absolute path and the other one is a baseline path. So the absolute path uh, basically uh, defines a benchmark, which is right now 400 kilogram of CO2 per square meter, uh, and that um, the gross floor area for that excludes the parkade. Um, I'll talk about it. The materials are included, but the floor area is not. Um, um, so this is this is the benchmark. But then, so as I mentioned, for 2023, we're saying the limit is double of the baseline, which means double of the 400, which is 800. And then moving to 2025 for buildings that can be built with wood, the low rise buildings, the limit will be 20% or 320. And the rest of the buildings are 10% or 360. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we are going to finalize these for the 2025 when we take, uh, take the uh, final code proposal language to the council next year. Um, where we got that uh, 400 number, and uh, there's like there, there's always been this hot debate on um, if we are ready to set an absolute target and what that should be. So as I mentioned, we have been collecting data on our rezoning projects since 20. Uh, seven, 2017 and basically looking at that data so this graph basically shows on the left the low rise wood buildings the high rise concrete building low rise concrete building and high rise wood buildings um, and and we can as you can see a majority of our wood buildings already will be under the re reduction requirements so they will meet the limit and then um, again like the the average or or the um, medium of most of the categories are actually below that. So uh, we want we are wanting to make a, a a target that is achievable, but also we want to set a target that leads into reduction. And uh, I guess if you have been following the guidelines process, you might know that initially we only talked about setting an baseline path and not an absolute path. Uh, and the base that the absolute path was added to simplify projects that are already doing a pretty good job and maybe don't need to set a baseline. But what happens if a project doesn't meet those uh, reduction uh, or, or caps that we are defining the 360 and 320, they can always go through the second path, which is a baseline path in that they define a baseline according to the guideline and then they reduce it by 20%. If it's a low rise that can be built wood and be built with wood and 10% if it is a high, any other building basically. Um, um, so again, uh, the project have the option to choose from the two approaches. Um, and of course, collecting data, we will always look into improving these uh, uh, targets. Um, moving on to defining the uh, scope uh, or basically the object of assessment. So, so the scope for life cycle stages, uh, we are including A1 to A5, which is product and construction, B1 to B5, which is use, end of life C1 to C4. Uh, projects can opt to report their uh, emissions, I mean, sorry, embodied carbon on a D stage as well. They can also 
uh, report their biogenic carbon and concrete carbonation, but these uh, basically module D biogenic and concrete carbonation cannot be accounted for the reduction. Um, and again, I think this is also another hot topic, but the reason we are holding off on these is to make sure that the, there is more consistency um, in the in the methodology, so that we can we can confidently add these um, to to our our scope. But again, this is what we have in our scope right now. And what I would say is that we are basically relying on the tool. So if a tool um, includes uh, say V1 to V5, and it may miss one of the modules, say it may miss V3. Uh, that's okay, as long as the, the tool has the used stage. Um, I, Anthony will talk a little bit more about what happens if the tools don't have uh, one of the life cycle stages, say if it doesn't have use or end of life. But again, as long as the tool has a life cycle stage, if it's missing one or two of whatever of the modules within that life cycle stage, that's okay. And it's not, it's not needed to be added. Uh, so basically, to say that the defaults can be used um, unless the team has data from their specific project or if they uh, have data, regional data that is uh, more representative than what the tool has, um, but they don't have to. And then in terms of uh, building elements, we are requiring including structure and shell. As a, as a mandatory scope. Uh, and then we also have optional scope, which is basically everything else, interior services, uh, site work and whatnot. Uh, the, the thing I wanna point here is that if projects decide to include the optional scope, they can decide to include or exclude them for the reduction. So uh, say if the project has done an exercise to include services, but have including it will uh, hurt them in achieving that target, they can always stick to the mandatory scope. But if they have done something that has reduced their services emissions, in body carbon emissions, they can always include it in the reporting and take credit for it. Uh, and then again, I think I briefly mentioned on how we are including the materials and how we are calculating the floor area. This is more um, important for the absolute pathway because on the baseline pathway is a it's a relative to a baseline, so that may not matter as much. But basically, for the absolute pathway, we are asking projects to include all materials above and below grade. So if there's a parkade on their ground, they would include materials used there. But when they're calculating the gross floor area to calculate the um, embodied carbon or global warming potential, the intensity, uh, they would they should not include the uh, underground parkade in, in, in their floor area. Um, in terms of, so now moving on to how, how to quantify embodied carbon. So basically making sure that, that we have uh, consistency in the approach, the sources of materials used and, and all of that. So uh, starting with bill of material, which as you all may know is the one of, I mean, if not the most, one of the most important inputs of a whole building LCA. So it's pretty crucial to make sure that we have a high quality bill of material. Um, and the sources that they allow being used, it, teams can use the BIM model, they can use the cost estimates, uh, or they can do manual quantity takeoff. And it doesn't have to be one of these, it can be a combination of them. So if the project has a BIM model that is missing, say, um, I don't know, like uh, the foundation, they can use their takeoff to add that. Uh, we we are for the for the building permit stage, which is um, the submission that is required according to VBBL. Um, we are not accepting um, the early design tools that are not based on the building geometry. So, um, as example of that is um, embodied carbon pathfinder, which we accept for the rezoning stage. Uh, because that's an earlier stage, but but when it comes to the uh, building pyramid stage, we want to have material quantity based on the project. However, um, well, like another example of these tools is uh, one click LCA, the um, uh, carbon designer tool. Um, again, we are saying that those tools cannot be used as in the building pyramid stage, but if there is a an element that is not major, um, and, and we leave that to the judgment of the 
project team uh, and it's difficult to quantify and it's not in the BIM model. They, they can use the quantification approaches in those tools and use the assemblies that are in those tools to quantify that specific material. Um, again, uh, we, yeah, I guess. Um, Moving on uh, to, uh, so so one, one other thing we have done is that we basically uh, made sure that we are uh, providing as much as, as, as much as the details as much as possible on what elements and sub elements should be included. So in the appendix of the guidelines, you see this table, which basically provides the breakdown of the elements uh, by uh, Omni class. Uh, and we are providing all the way down to level four. So for example, if, when we say foundation is mandatory, we also say what sub elements in the foundation is required and what is optional. And we always ask to report the optional separate from required to make sure that if p p projects are not penalized for including optional elements. Um, and oh, another thing I should say is that we are providing this table by Omni class because this is the best approach identified in the literature on, on providing elements breakdown, but the teams don't need to do their bill of material based on this. All they need to do is to look at this table and make sure the elements that are defined here are included in their bill of material, but they can organize it uh, however they prefer. In terms of the level of completeness, uh, a good source for that one is the KPMB uh, lab whole building LCA classification system. So we say for rezoning, we accept class D and class C, which is uh, class D is basically intensity per uh, um, floor area by building type. Uh, um, class C is assembly definition, which again, we accept the early design tools for, for these. For this stage and then for for the building permit we ask for class b which is based on individual material and products um uh and then in terms of the tools that they're accepting uh as i meant uh, i guess as i mentioned earlier so the in the rezoning permit we accept tools that are uh, uh, basically early design higher level gener general typical assemblies based on the project type uh, for rezoning. So Athena assembly approach, one click LCA carbon designer and the pathfinder. Uh, but for building permit, we need, we, we, we would want pro projects to use tools that are uh, quantifying emissions based on the quantity of materials in the project. So Athena, one click LCA tally, LCA tally cat and EC3 are the tools that are currently available in the market. Um, in terms of the documentation, so uh, we are asking projects to submit a design report, as I mentioned. So this uh, on the right is a screenshot of the first page, so the instructions. But we also do ask to submit raw data from software tools, which we have, uh, and by we, I mean Anthony, has <laughs> developed a, a, a very detailed and very well done um, guidance on how to submit those. Uh, we also ask for submission of manual calculations if uh, the teams have done calculation outside the tools because of the limitations of the tools that they wanted to reflect something specific in their project. So we would ask them to submit the raw data as is without touching it. And then whatever they have done outside the tool, they, we would want them to submit that to us. And they, they can optionally submit a supporting report if there is something that couldn't be included in the design report or if they have developed a report, say for lead or a zero carbon building standard and they would like to share that with us that's optional but not required uh, in terms of what we are collecting in the um, in the design report uh, we, we collect the generic metadata project information that 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 it will then help us understand and improve uh, the um, uh, say, for example, absolute target by project type and 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 more, a more detailed understanding of what impacts the project's embodied carbon. Um, generically, like basically, like what's the project um, type, uh, the floor area, which we ask for uh, floor area without and uh, without parquet, and then we ask for parquet separate separately. So basically, our data can be used in the um, uh, uh, benchmarking uh, programs that may include parquet. Uh, 
Um, we ask for some info on the project structure, for example, which again, we would, uh, th this is basically very much aligned with best practices. Uh, so CLF or EC3, like the groups that are looking into what's most important to collect to understand embodied carbon. Uh, we asked for some info on project, the, the embodied carbon modeling. So like what tool it's used, um, what uh, uh, life cycle stages are included. Some of these are automatic. So based on the tool that is selected, that these will be selected. Some can be override if, if there is a difference or if they want to, if they have entered manual info, for example. Uh, um, yeah, and then for example, the optional elements, they can specify if they're included included in reporting and compliance if it's a baseline approach. If it's absolute, they automatically will be excluded. Um, and then we ask for some like assumptions and what they have done to reduce the emissions from the project. Um, things like um, if they have, I think we have something in our guidelines that talks about if design for the construction, for example, is included, the project can take some credit by reducing uh, mod assuming 50% reduction in module C, for example. So we will ask that so it can be incorporated in the result. And then this is the result and compliance page. Basically, uh, the team has specified the base, the, the compliance path, the date that they're submitting. So this is assuming it's a 2025. Um, we ask if, it's, if the project could be built with wood, if responsible material sourcing is met. And then based on that, and then the baseline, and so for example, this is a, an example of a baseline path. Um, the tool identifies what's the reduction requirements, what is the reduction requirement achieved, and what is the, the reduction for uh, mandatory elements. Um, and then so this is the continuation of that. Basically, the teams will enter input the results. And again, like if they tell us that the tool does not include some of the life cycle stages, it will be calculated based on what we have provided in the guidelines. Um, I think that is it for me. I went a little over, but I'll just pass it back to Roberta. That was great, Zara. Thank you. Uh, great uh, outline of the guidelines. Uh, we will maybe condense the Q&A just a little bit to make up some uh, some overtime. Uh, one of the things, one of the questions that was dropped in the chat, I was just going to go chrono chronologically here. Farshid was asking, what's the target applicable to mixed use, like say six story buildings that the ground floor should be like non-combustible concrete and the rest is, is combustible. Does the design report allow for like an area weighted target between 20, 10 and 20%? Currently, no, we are not doing that. So if if the um, upper levels are allowed to be built with, with wood, we assume it's a wood building. Okay, so- But again, one... yeah, okay. sorry, go ahead. So it's one, it, the overriding building material is what is used for the baseline then? Yes. For yes. the calculation, okay. Um, Isa was asking, how do you ensure consistency in the assumptions and data sources like LCI versus EPD? Uh, of the historical data used for the baseline? Um, we are using the, we are basically asking project teams to use the latest uh, um, whole building LCA tool versions that are available, but because we are collecting data, which includes build of material and includes the embodied carbon result, if at some point we realize that, say, the LCI database used in the tools or EPDs in the tools have significantly changed or has a very significant inconsistency, we can always go back and um, calibrate it if necessary. But again, uh, collecting that bill of material from projects will play a big role in understanding um, if necessary, uh, we need to calibrate tools to make sure that they are comparable. But right now we're accepting what tools are using. Um, and so as long as the teams use a tool that we accept, that they're good. Yeah, I was gonna say, so the two, it's kind of up to the tools uh, to ensure the consistency and assumptions, or is it is it is it up to the city of Vancouver or the user of the tool? So uh, Anthony will start talking about what, okay. for example, what EPDs we will accept, say, for example, for, for concrete. So we have specific guidance on um, if the tool allows you to choose um, a, a, an EPD, what you should choose. If a tool allows you to, say, uh, add transportation distance, you can add it. 
but again, um, we, for now, we are just saying that as long as these tools are used and the assumptions that are specifically mentioned in the tables in the guideline, which Anthony will talk about, um, we, we, ex we rely on tools basically to improve that quality and consistency. And we already are seeing a very uh, fast and significant move to making sure these are, these are consistent. Um, Mohammed was asking, uh, I think he put this up when you were talking about the, the different ways that you can measure and report embodied carbon and archetypes. He was asking about uh, archetypes. Have you considered using archetypes as a basis for measuring and reporting as well? Um, so we asked projects to tell us what's their major and like primary and secondary use. For now, we don't have absolute targets based on uh, archetypes. Um, it may it may we may add it in future if we identify significant variation. But at this stage. Uh, we are not differentiating for the targets based on archetype. I mean, the only one is that 10% or 20% reduction based on the building height and if it can be built with, with combustible structure. Remember, we had a webinar at one point where we were, we were talking about archetypes. I think it was September where there was a Pathfinder tool that came out there and it's based on archetypes. And we were talking about how it's very useful at the schematic design stage early, early on, whether you're trying to figure out whether you're off side or on side to the regs. But I think... Uh, I, I guess to summarize what you're saying, you're looking for something more detailed and more less less uh, high level for the reporting. So for for rezoning projects, can say if the archetypes that are in Pathfinder matches their project, they can use it. We we do strongly recommend though to use tools that are more reflecting ge the geometry of the project. So um, Athena assembly uh, approach, for example, where you pick the assembly but you also input some uh, some characteristics of your project or the one-click LCA, the um, 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 uh, carbon designer tool. So these also do what you're saying. So you would specify what's your project archetype and they use their databases or their assumptions to come up with an estimate, which is more reflective of your project. But if say a project is a very large site of master plan, and there's very little information on that project using something like Pathfinder, which is by archetype makes sense. But again, um, be, 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 I, I would also expect, or, or I think that's kind of ex, um, ex, uh, expected that I, I also Pathfinder may improve as they will have more data. Because right now it's based on a few um, uh, or, or a number of um, um, modeled uh, um, buildings. And, and again, like, they can use it, but it, it would be good to start the whole building LCA early on using the project data so they know where they are when moving to the 2025 requirements. Gotcha. Wonderful. Thank you, Zara. I think um, maybe what we'll do is we'll move to the next stage here uh, with Anthony. So I'd like to introduce Anthony, who's the principal at Preopta, and he'll be talking about be doing a deeper dive into the uh, baseline setting and data collection approaches. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, one second. Let me just. OK, so uh, continuing off where Zara left off, uh, I'm going to be diving a bit deeper into um, specific parts of the embodied carbon guidelines, uh, in particular around baseline definition, around modeling assumptions, and also around the data collection aspect as well. So um, this is kind of a repeat of a similar graph to what Zara showed earlier, but this is based on even older data, like data up until 2021. But the, the data points that are mapped here are from the city of Vancouver's rezoning um, submissions. So again, these are kind of very early stage submissions, right? So this is not like based on building permit submissions where we have more detailed material quantity takeoffs. So um, we recognize that like these, these numbers could potentially vary. But based on this data, I, I'm more just trying to illustrate the difference between the absolute and the baseline approach, as uh, Sarah mentioned, there's two different compliance pathways. You can go down the absolute pathway. Currently, um, you know, the benchmark is set at 400. So 2x that is 800 uh, in 2025. Notionally, if, if it approved by city council, it'll be 10% for all other buildings, 20% for buildings that can be low rise, that can be built with wood, right? But um, practically, what does this mean on projects, right? So for example, if you're modeling projects that are below the absolute threshold that you need to comply with, you may not need to you may not need to model a baseline at all. Um, I think there's still a lot of value in modeling a baseline approach, but definitely if, for example, your your building is kind of near these thresholds or you're above those thresholds, um, then yeah, you may choose to uh, 
a model a baseline approach because um, the thing is it's really hard to come up with one number that works across every building, across every site condition and, and reflects all massing geometries and building types, right? So um, I think having a baseline approach still actually makes sense because um, when you define a baseline, it's as functionally equivalent as it can be for your given project, for your given site. And you can actually measure the actual intentional design decisions that were made to reduce those emissions. And so, you know, for those projects, you can go down this baseline path. And so I'm going to speak a bit more around uh, what goes into those assumptions, right? You can imagine there's a, you know, when we first started off this process two years ago, um, there was discussions around like, okay, how do we kind of tighten up the guidance around baseline definition? Because there's not a lot of, you know, guidance around this, for example, with LEED or uh, other project, um, you know, rating systems, they have very loose guidance, but there's a lot of nuances to that. Um, so uh, first off, we want uh, one of the key principles around baseline definition is that we want to maintain functional equivalence. So we particularly highlight three categories. So thermal equivalence. So the, the baseline building should be therm functionally equivalent to your proposed design from a thermal perspective. Uh, you can approximate that by looking at the clear wall assembly R value. So the, the, the main point probably to highlight is, for example, for insulation, if you're comparing against different types of installations, they got to have the same R values. Now, obviously, when it comes to like thermal performance, you can look to uh, a different level of detail, look at thermal bridging and do those types of calculations. So that's not required. You can you can do that and prove, uh, use thermal bridging calculations, for example, to kind of de demonstrate th uh, thermal equivalence. But you could, um, I think most projects will probably just uh, look at something like the clear wall R value and just make sure that th those things are functionally equivalent. And um, that's another way of demonstrating that. Uh, from a structural perspective, um, again, we want to make sure that the projects are functionally equivalent from a structural perspective. It doesn't mean that they need to be the same structural system or have exactly the same spans or whatnot, but they need to be reasonable and, and reasonable structures that would actually be typically designed for that given building. Um, when it comes to baseline definition, just and this applies for some of the future points that I'm going to highlight, there's a lot of room for professional judgment, and that that is key. So uh, some of these guidance, uh, the things that are highlighted in these guidelines, um, is meant to give you good kind of starting points uh, or default assumptions to use if you don't have anything better. But that said, there's definitely professional judgment that comes into play with this. So, you know, in the case of structural, you're going to, uh, you know, it's as determined from the structural engineer what uh, structural equivalence would look like, right? And and what would be a reflective of typical, um, you know, design parameters. Um, if we're, for example, comparing a mass timber building versus a concrete building, what would be good default assumptions for the concrete building? How would that affect the foundation? How would that affect, you know, what would be typical column spans, that sort of stuff for that given building type? And so that's um, input that the structural engineer could, for example, provide. Um, now, you can also model things like material efficiency strategies. So definitely, like, if you make intentional design decisions to, you know, change the column spans to get thinner slabs or to avoid transfer slabs, or you design with a lighter structure or lighter facade system, and that leads to smaller foundations, all those things are, are game. And so you can you can quantify those differences and differentiate between your baseline definition, which is typical design, and your proposed design, which is what you've actually intentionally modeled or, or designed. And then geometry uh, as well. So uh, effectively, like kind of the massing of the building, the program, the use, uh, uh, it's got to serve the same intended use. Um, yeah. Okay. Now there's two broad approaches to creating a baseline. One is to use the early design iteration. So in your earlier design iteration, you can use that as a basis of a baseline. Uh, it still needs to be functionally equivalent. And again, use professional judgment around that. Slight variations around the geometry, you know, across these design iterations are acceptable. But if there's any major changes, you know, changes in floor area, changes in use, use type spaces, uh, those things need to be reflected. Um, uh, and also, sometimes in the earlier design stage, there may be certain materials or building elements that aren't fully captured. For example, maybe in the early stage, you don't have a foundation design. Well, you still need to kind of add in those, those elements in when you're using an early design iteration, um, just so that we're still comparing apples to apples in a way. If your if your proposed design is you know at a later design phase, um, the and you know sometimes uh, if if your early design model is missing some of these materials or elements, and sometimes some of these elements are really hard to quantify. You could reference um, for those specific building elements or specific materials, you can reference comparable projects like past projects for those specific items, or you could potentially use some of these early whole building LCA 
uh, software tools. So for example, in Athena assembly builder method, you can just model that one specific assembly. Let's say it's open web steel joists space at a certain condition for a given loading condition. It's hard to figure out what, what the quantity of steel is associated with that. So you could kind of just model that specifically and then use that as a way of estimating those quantities. Um, same thing with like something like one click LCA's carbon designer. Basically they have the construction assembly. So assemblies with multiple material makeups. And so, you know, sometimes you can use some of those high level, uh, ways of estimating these quantities for some of these elements. Um, but just for the targeted assemblies or materials where you're missing materials. Um, uh, personally, I would recommend going down the second pathway, which is to in defining a baseline, which is to uh, use your proposed design as a starting point. Now, the point, the reason why this I think is maintains functional equivalence even better is that uh, oftentimes you're actually modeling with a similar level of detail, right? Because you're starting, let's say you're in design development or even later in in construction documents, um, you have your proposed design. You use you kind of make a copy of that, and then you swap out the design uh, options uh, that would be more reflective of typical practice. So you could change the structure, the assemblies, the materials. Uh, or even down to the individual materials, instead of using industry average data points, you use like, you know, your low carbon mix or your manufacturer specific, you know, XPS insulation, for example, to demonstrate the reductions achieved through that procurement requirement. So, but then everything else is the same, you know, the takeoffs, the geometry, the areas are all the same, right? And so that way you can maintain functional equivalence better. Um, but that said, uh, that's easier to do on certain tools, like maybe like one-click LCA versus other tools like Tally that's connected to your Revit model and depending on what you're modeling. And so that's why I think having this flexibility of using the early iteration versus proposed design is, is a path forward for this. Now, um, a lot of the embodied carbon, um, as we were developing these embodied carbon guidelines, we also tried to account for some of these tool specific nuances. So there's many different software tools out there here are some of the tools that are typically used in part nine. Uh, and, you know, I know some of these, I think there's a question in the chat about pH ribbon. Like I, I know this could also be used for part three buildings as well. So, but yeah, generally speaking, the typical tools that we see being used in the part three world are some of these tools, right? And so, but right now there's still differences between these tools, differences in the underlying databases or the features or functionality. And so we try to account for some of that um, as we were developing these guidelines, uh, recognizing that these tools are also in a state of development and new features are being released and, and there's future developments planned for all of these tools. So just want to highlight a, a few points. So for example, on the life cycle stages that we're modeling, um, the required stages are module A to C, as um, Zara mentioned, module D is reported separately. For life cycle stage A1 to A3, the default values that you should use are either industry average EPDs or you can or generic data points that are kind of defaults within the software tool like tools like Athena or Tally, those should be used as your default assumption for both your baseline definition uh, and in your proposed design, if you're not actually specifically specifying a low carbon product in your in your des proposed design. But in your proposed design, if you, you can use manufacturer or product specific EBDs um, when you're actually specifying them in your project documents. So for example, if you're setting um, a, a max GWP threshold for that given material category in, in your specifications, or you kind of highlight that on your drawings, or you you say like, you know, this or equivalent uh, performance, uh, this product or equivalent performance from a GWP perspective, you can kind of, um, there's a few different ways that you can demonstrate this. Um, basically, if you're making an intentional design decision to um, uh, procure low carbon products, um, then you can reflect that in your baseline, or, or sorry, in your proposed design. Um, for these later life cycle stages, from module A4 all the way to C, you can use the default tool values, um, and you are also allowed to modify those assumptions. So for example, A4 is transportation distance. Maybe the defaults in the tools don't make sense, and you have better information given your project-specific um, you know, setting or also regionally specific data. Um, if, if you have higher quality kind of data points for these things, you can manually override this. Um, now, any modified assumptions, uh, as Zara mentioned, needs to be um, described and justified in the design report. Um, this is probably one of the more novel aspects of this uh, guideline. One of the things is uh, we know there are certain tools, for example, EC3 uh, as a database currently only has module A1 to A3 values, and you can model A4 and A5 as well in that tool. But uh, it's obviously missing the module B and module C. Um, and so what we've done uh, is actually create these uh, temporary kind of placeholder values that you can use 
as and these are defined as a percentage of the A1 to A3 values. And so, for example, uh, A4 is 4% of A1 to A3. It, so if it's missing, if your tool is missing A4 or missing A5 or missing B1 to B5 or C1 to C4, you can use these uh, placeholder assumptions as ways of um, uh, modeling the, the, the results. Now, we recognize this is not an ideal approach. The, these percentages are not necessarily accurate for every single project or every single tool. But the point is, this is kind of like a temporary placeholder because some of these tools, like for example, EC3, our understanding is that they, these are current gaps, but they're planning to address this in the future, fill out those future life cycle stages. Um, but we didn't want to exclude those tools because some of those tools are also, they have um, a lot of uh, relevant low carbon procurement options in there to demonstrate reductions as well. And so we wanted to kind of adapt the guidelines to uh, allow for that. Uh, some other points, uh, I hit on most of these, so I won't, I'll skip through many of these, but building lifespan, assuming for 60 years, that's not to say that we're predicting the building will last for 60 years. It's just to standardize the LCA assessment so that the results are more comparable. Uh, we actually included, um, uh, so for your individual materials or elements, uh, building elements, um, the all the tools have different default service lifespans. Um, so you can definitely use those defaults. Uh, we also provided a, a, in Appendix C, Table 6, we actually provided some breakdown of some um, starting point assumptions for those different building elements as well, which you could choose to use if, you, if you'd like. Um, uh, reported separately, you know, that have been not included in the main calculations. That's biogenic carbon, concrete carbonation, and land use change. Uh, let's see. I think, yeah, let's see. Actually, the rest of this was covered by Zara. Uh, yeah, just to emphasize that, you know, for the classification of the building elements, each tool has different ways of classifying building elements, and not all of them have omni-class classification, for example. So, um, you know, that whole appendix table is not meant to uh, highlight. Uh, it's more meant to show what elements are in, are required in the scope and which elements are in, optional in the scope. And sometimes there's not a lot of clarity around that. And so we went to, you know, Omniclass level four to just show that level of detail. But that doesn't mean you have to classify your elements exactly according to Omniclass, because we recognize that's, that's potentially not possible for some of the tools. Um, and the other thing is that the materials that are required for thermal, moisture, acoustic, and fire protection should also be included. So it, within your structure and envelope, if you, yeah, if you have those materials that still are needed to meet those uh, requirements, you need to include those. Okay, so uh, now default assumptions, uh, which can be used both for your baseline definition and also in your proposed design, potentially, if you don't have information on this. Uh, we have default assumptions by building element. So again, there's professional judgment. The, these are not the definitive thing that every project should assume, but these are probably pretty good starting points uh, for you to use. And so we break this down by, you know, building element, what uh, default materials or products assumptions to use, uh, like for subgrade. And sometimes we actually have some points of differentiation. So for example, for roof construction, um, we're, we're not differentiating by building archetype, but for example, if you have a long span roof, it's you use steel trusses instead of, but then if it's a typical span or a shorter span, um, you might use uh, conventionally, uh, conventional concrete uh, with reinforcement. Um, uh, Exterior walls, we might differentiate between some building types in, in some certain elements where, where necessary. Uh, but essentially, yeah, there's there's these different types of assumptions, assumptions which you can refer to. For example, for roofs, you know, conventional roof, you use polyiso for insulation. But if it's an inverted roof, you use XPS for insulation as a baseline definition and, and as a default assumption because that's more common practice. So there's some of these different types of uh, nuances that we tried to highlight inside of this. Um, uh, but yeah, again, to emphasize, use professional judgment. This is just a starting point um, for you to um, use. Now, that was at the assembly level. What about on the individual materials? Like what which data points should you be pointing to? And so we try to give a lot more detailed guidance around this as well. So for each category of material, at least for the major materials. So for example, for concrete, um, you know, in the early design phases, you may not have, you know, strengths for your concrete. And so we give you some default assumptions around that. Uh, definitely when you get into building permit, you should probably have a good idea of that. And so you should be using the actual strengths of concrete that are used on the project. Um, and uh, yeah, and so we just give you some kind of high level guidance. Um, you should be using the BC Provincial Industry Average uh, as a baseline, or sorry, the EPD as a uh, the baseline data point, uh, especially for your baseline definition. Um, 
where possible, but we recognize also within certain tools, those data points, points don't exist. And so we kind of give some uh, tool specific guidance here as well. Uh, next up, insulation. So for example, we highlight in particular with XPS uh, because there's a, uh, um, previously up until 2021, all the XPS in North America had HFC blowing agents. So they were, you know, like 10, 10 X higher <laughs> uh, in, in emissions compared to the new generation of XPS products, which all the major manufacturers now have. And so, um, you know, for the baseline definition for XPS, we particularly call out that, uh, you need to use, um, you cannot refer to the old HFC based insulation as a baseline definition, you can refer to one of the manufacturer specific EPDs within the new um, generation of uh, EPDs. Um, same thing, same, same idea with closed cell spray foam. So we ju we're just highlighting some specific um, points that uh, where the, the assumptions can vary quite significantly on these. Um, yeah, glazing again, we have some, some um, guidance around that uh, rebar. Um, Basically, for most of the uh, these material categories, we were particularly trying to point you to the industry average um, kind of generic data point that that exists within the tools. Uh, so uh, we'll oftentimes try to name like the actual um, industry organization, which oftentimes are the groups that are publishing the industry average uh, EPDs, um, and get some high level points. Uh, for example, if you're using post tension slabs, this is you know, one of those things that's sometimes harder to quantify. Maybe we don't have EPDs on the tendons. And so we give some very specific guidance. So uh, essentially like, you know, to step back a bit, when we were developing these guidelines, one of the things was trying to figure out what are the questions that LCA practitioners would sometimes ask when they're actually modeling this and how, what, how can we try to preemptively answer these questions as much as possible? Now, obviously we may not cover everything, but um, we tried our best to, you know, with the current state of the knowledge uh, and, and available information. Um, steel, again, try to use the industry average data points, um, especially for the baseline definition. If you have manufacturer specific data points, you're welcome to use those, uh, aluminum, wood, uh, same thing. And, uh, for services like MEP products, we know there's not a lot of EPDs available. So we also, um, kind of highlight the SIBC TN65 methodology. Um, now obviously for MEP systems, this is optional, right? So it's not one of the required scopes, but if you are reporting, we kind of point you to some resources and how you might quantify those as well. Um, okay. So that was, I, I covered assembly level assumptions. I covered material specific assumptions. Now we get into a third section, which is like, um, if you're going down the baseline path, how do you actually um, quantify some of these design measures? Like if you're gonna have incorporate building reuse, how do you quantify that? Now for your proposed design, obviously like you're just gonna model your proposed design. If you're going down the absolute path and you're just using you, all your modeling as your proposed design, you're just gonna model that as it is. But, um, but if you're going down the baseline path, this, is, this table may be more helpful for you. Um, so for example, you know, uh, reduced demolition, uh, currently we don't account for that because the existing building is kind of a sunk cost and that's, uh, those are emissions that have already been emitted and they're, um, and it's kind of, out of outside of the scope of the existing building. Who knows? Maybe this is something that we revisit later on. Um, I think the standards are kind of, uh, uh, of two minds about this right now and <laughs> as they're being, de um, developed, but currently we're considering that as out of scope. Um, uh, and it's also kind of hard to S quantify, you know, the existing building LCA because there hasn't been an LCA done of that existing building properly, right? So um, reduced demolition, we don't account for that. Uh, for reuse, this is probably particularly important. So for example, if you're reusing certain building elements in your project uh, of that existing building, for example, or you're, uh, or you're just incorporating reused materials, you know, from another site, um, wherever you're using reused materials, you can assume new materials being used in the baseline design, but in your proposed design, you're you're obviously not reusing you're not using new materials and so you wouldn't have the a1 to a3 values there for that um reused material uh, uh yeah so there's some points on the salvage uh materials and design for disassembly um uh design for disassembly is kind of hard to quantify right now uh well how do i say it it's a uh, yeah it's a uh, you should still use the module a C and D right now for uh, modeling the design for disassembly. So currently there's not really a reduction um, shown as a result of that. Again, th these are kind of emerging topics. Some of these things may get revisited as we update the guidelines, but currently that's um, the guidance here. Um, Sorry, okay, Anthony. 
just sorry, go ahead. Hop in in on that yep. one on the design for disassembly. So I think what you're mentioning is that for the baseline, you assume you're designing as is. So you assume module B and C as they are. But if somebody does design for the construction following the standards, they can assume in their proposed design 50% reduction. On oh, the this was the 50%. So, right, right, right. Yes. yes. Sorry. They that's take what, credit that, for that. That's what the session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I get confused a bit. Yes. Um, yeah, 50, you can deduct 50% on the module C. Yeah, I can already see there's like hot conversation. On yeah, yeah, yeah. And this there's assembly, a, there's a lot of topics just... we're trying to address. <laughs> and Sorry, Zara has been up many late nights trying to <laughs> get this across the finish line. There's a lot of topics we're trying to tackle. So it's not a perfect guideline, but I think we're trying to do our best right now um, with- Sorry uh, to interrupt, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, all good. that's great. Um, reduce underground parking. That's one of the key uh, ways that you could definitely reduce the material quantities used on your project. And so um, there's three options for how you can do it. Um, uh, option three is basically, you know, the parking's the same in both the pay proposed design and in the baseline design, there's no reduced material quantity. So you can definitely model it that way, right? Um, alternatively, if you want to demonstrate a reduced material quantities with underground parking, you can go with option one, for example, assuming city of Vancouver's minimum parking requirements. So maybe you come up with an estimate from body carbon intensity per stall, or, you could um, maybe uh, the second option may be a bit easier to model. So for example, the number of below grade stories to uh, estimate, or, or sorry, use as your baseline definition, which is a function of the number of above grade stories. So you can look at this table. If your above grade stories is, you know, whatever range it falls under, this is the number of uh, levels of parkade that you can assume. And then you'd have some embodied carbon intensity per level of parkade to estimate. And that's one way of estimating this. So well, basically, uh, one of the ideas around this is that how can we um, uh, create a pathway for you to uh, demonstrate reductions if you made intentional decision to reduce uh, underground parking, which would reduce the concrete and reduce um, embodied carbon. Uh, that's on the baseline definition. Um, for structural material efficiencies, for example, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, essentially, wherever there's intentional structural material efficiency design choices that have been made, the baseline design can reflect the typical design as determined by the structural engineer. Um, there's, uh, so for, ex uh, for example, these are some examples of things that you could do in your baseline, or sorry, in your proposed design. Maybe you're reducing the base size uh, or the, col uh, the column spacing to get to thinner slabs or um, avoiding transfer slabs, et cetera. So if you're doing those things in the proposed design, you can reflect kind of what would be conventional design in your baseline design. Um, if you want to learn more about this, uh, there's a great resource, ASC um, from SEI and SEI on um, specifically around whole building LCA uh, modeling for structural engineering. And so that had a lot of information around baseline definition, which you could refer to. It's an optional resource. You don't, it's a paid resource, but um, it's uh, if you want to learn more about it, there's there some information there as well. But there's obviously a lot of room for professional judgment here. Um, Finishes, uh, well, interior finishes are optional as a scope, but if you do include it and and you are making intentional design to choices around your interior finishes that are lower in body carbon, uh, your your uh, baseline can reflect typical finishes. And I recognize it can be a bit challenging to determine because sometimes they don't have industry average data points depending on what finishes you're talking about. But um, yeah, that's uh, something that you can reflect there. Um, and then a minimizing construction waste. If efforts have been made to reduce construction waste on site, uh, proposed design can override the default material waste percentages in the tool to demonstrate uh, some of these reductions as well. Um, I'm not sure if all these projects are necessarily gonna achieve or pursue these different pathways, but we're trying to address these potential like edge topics that, uh, or strategy, not edge topics, but like strategies that teams may pursue and how would you actually quantify this? Um, Designing with low carbon alternatives. Uh, oh, I'm going to try to move through this quickly. Actually, I just realized we're a little short on time. Um, yeah, effectively, like if you're designing with lower embodied carbon materials, you can you can model that in your proposed design, and your baseline design refers to the uh, the baseline assumptions or the default assumptions that I already covered earlier around the assembly at the assembly level and also at the material level. Um, carbon storing materials currently are not included, uh, as in like the biogenic carbon is not included in the reduction calculation. It can be reported separately, but you don't demonstrate a reduction with it currently at least. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm just going to skip through this. Um, and obviously the, probably one of the main pathways that a lot of teams are using to reduce 
emissions is like the procurement approach. So like the specific materials that you're procuring that are lower carbon, you know, lower carbon concrete or lower carbon insulation, you can kind of reflect those choices. Um, getting into the data collection, again, um, this is, uh, Zara already covered this, but in that spreadsheet submission template, you could think of like a lot of that data is to collect the project metadata about the building. Um, and, um, and obviously it includes the high level full building else or the high level embodied carbon results that you're also reporting, but mainly, you know, for example, the number of stories above grade, below grade, the, uh, floor area with parkade, without parkade, the primary building use type, et cetera. All that information is going to be very useful for doing much more robust benchmarking. Um, and so having that data plus the granular raw data as exported from all the main tools. So you don't have to do any post-processing. You basically, whichever tools you're using, whether it's Athena, Tally, one click or whatever, you spit out the spreadsheet as they export it. You include that as an attachment. And basically by having both this raw data and the project metadata, we're going to be able to do much more uh, robust um, benchmarking and also quality assurance checks on the whole building LCS. Um, and so this is a, um, a page uh, that's included that in, is it, that gives um, guidance around the raw data submission instructions. So I've actually recorded some video tutorials for each of the tools uh, that, that we've talked about to, on like what to export and how to export it and how to submit those results. Um, okay, I'm actually going to pass it back off to Zara. Uh, to go over the key developments. Yeah, I think I just wanted to quickly talk about the next steps. And again, I've I've been trying to follow the conversation <laughs> in the chat, which is pretty active. But um, it this is not a comprehensive list, but these are a few of the uh, key uh, next steps that we are uh, focusing on. Uh, so let me just quickly share my screen again. Um, after this, we'll pass to a, a, a shorter, a short Q&A uh, to cap it yes. off. So we've got about another 20 minutes or so. In yeah, so basically uh, what I wanted to say is that like from now that these guidelines are out and, and so we are first focused on the compliance assessment of the, the submissions that are effective now. So the BP application that are coming in, we wanna make sure that we support the applicants and provide input as they go through the process if they have any questions. So both for embodied carbon and mass timber projects. Uh, we are working or we are interested in uh, looking into developing an op online submission and review platform. So the idea is to automate as much as possible the quality control and compliance process to reduce the load on the jurisdiction, especially that will go far when, when you're looking into uh, smaller jurisdictions that may have lower capacity, but also city of Vancouver because of the per permitting process. We just wanna make sure that this is done as efficiently as possible and, and minimum um, staff uh, input may be required if there's something that gets flagged. So that's the idea, but we are, we're far away to get there. It's, it's something that we are interested in exploring. We are looking into expanding the code, of course. So one, so I mentioned we have two compliance pathways. We are looking into adding one more pathway, which is more a prescriptive-like approach. So uh, some people uh, are, are talking about doing a whole building LCA may not be as valuable if you're really not looking into efficiency in your design or like the whole, how you can say use less material or Basically, if you're just substituting, say, concrete that you have with a low low intensity concrete, um, maybe you don't need to do a whole building LCA because it's an exercise that doesn't add much value. Again, like if they meet the requirements, we're looking into how we could add uh, a, a, a more prescriptive material specific requirements. Um, Cal Green, which is um, another North American regulation that now has embodied carbon requirements. I mean, starting, I think it's next year, but they have something like that. So we are looking into other others and also looking into um, the approaches that we are exploring. So that's one big thing. We are interested in adding biogenic carbon, especially for um, uh, insulation and materials with shorter lifetime, given that they have the capacity to store carbon and it can, can play a big role in achieving our uh, cl uh, climate targets. Um, for that, we need more consistency in the approach. We're also looking into part nine buildings. So we do have an ongoing near zero program. So near zero program, uh, which is actually managed by Zeke um, um, and Zebex, 
uh, basically is a program that provides funding for part nine buildings that um, they ha it has multiple streams and stream two is embodied carbon. So we provide the program provides funding and then collects data on these low embodied carbon housing pro houses, like uh, smaller houses, part nine buildings. Uh, to understand and learn from them and help the rest of the industry uh, um, catch up. So again, part nine is the other focus area. We are also looking into mass timber construction. We do know that mass timber can have a significant impact on reducing embodied carbon, but given that it's a more, um, um, it's a newer construction process, there's a lot of uh, challenges with, that the project teams are facing. So we are looking into providing some zoning incentives for mass timber projects. We are looking into changing BBBL, the, the bylaws, so to enable uh, in mass timber in more applications um, and also capacity building. So uh, we would want to make sure that we support groups like CLFBC and, and any other knowledge sharing initiatives um, that help the industry uh, learn and, and share uh, with each other. We want to we wanna look into developing case studies of best practices um, to, to ensure the targets that are coming um, are achievable. Uh, we are also learning from our own city projects, which we have set the, um, the target of 40% uh, reduction for them, uh, supporting educational programs and trainings. And then also we are coordinating with other organizations and jurisdictions, such as CAGBC with their uh, zero carbon building standard or the federal government as they're moving toward their greening the, <laughs> their, their target for, for the federal, uh, federal buildings. Again, I think the idea is learning from the process that we have gone through for operational carbon and make sure that we move as consistency as possible instead of working out on our on our silos. Um, I'm gonna stop here. Back to uh, Roberto. Um, I don't know, Anthony. Did you? If you uh, want to, yeah, actually, actually, yeah, two quick slides to yeah. share. Um, can you stop sharing? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Okay. Da -da -da. Okay. So I just wanted to highlight just. Um, just to place this in context, you know, these embodied carbon guidelines for the city of Vancouver, what else is happening beyond and how does this work also connect? Um, obviously, there's a lot of embodied carbon policy um, and work in across Canada, the US and the EU. So actually, this is a map of all the policies that are happening across, you know, North America and Europe. Um, there's a link with CLF that has a current policy tracker. Um, just to highlight a few points, um, as Zara mentioned, the, the at the federal level, there's the Greening Government Strategy from the Treasury Board Secretary. Um, and so that applies to fe federal major construction. So they have a 10% reduction on for concrete right now. Uh, by In 2025, it's going to be a 30% reduction on structural materials, plus whole building LSA disclosure. Uh, City of Vancouver has the, in their Toronto Green Standard version 4, they have embodied carbon requirements for municipal projects to be below 350 kilograms of CO2 per meter square. It's actually looking at upfront embodied carbon, not A to C. Um, there's uh, actually, there's a discussion about or conversation around putting embodied carbon technical requirements in, to be introduced into the national model codes for the 2030 code cycle. Uh, that's what the Canadian Board of Harmonized Construction Codes. And so I think some of those discussions are probably gonna start next year or so um, uh, to shape those requirements. Um, Cal Green, there's a, that requirement is coming into effect uh, in June of next year. Uh, they have three different compliance pathways, one of which is a 10% reduction on whole building LCA. There's the Pacific Coast Collaborative, of which City of Vancouver is part of as well. Uh, so it includes the provinces, states, and municipalities uh, along the West Coast. So basically BC plus the West Coast of the US. Um, the CAGBC currently has a zero carbon building standard technical advisory group uh, to help shape the V4 version of the zero carbon building standard. Um, and they're going to be looking at some of the embodied carbon uh, requirements, uh, uh, how that's going to be revised. Uh, LEED version 5 currently also in development. There's also going to be a focus on embodied carbon there. Um, that's kind of at the policy level. And then also on the standards and guidelines, um, NRC has already published whole building LCA guidelines. They're currently also working on LCI development and other related activities as well to support the ecosystem. Um, there's an embodied carbon harmonization and optimization project, uh, currently mainly U.S. stakeholders, but hopefully we can get some Canadian stakeholders in there as well to kind of harmonize amongst, you know, all the different groups that are report asking for whole, uh, embodied carbon uh, to kind of develop common requirements and harmonize. Uh, there's the ASHRAE and International Code Council standard 240P that's currently in development as well. That's going to be a standard that uh, could potentially be something that gets referenced by code in the U.S. and maybe in, in North America as well. That's currently in development. Uh, RICS version two, 2 in the U.K. is currently 
has recently been published. And so there's uh, um, all the people that are developing standards are all looking at each other and referring to each other's work. And so I think there's good ideas across all these. And, and we've definitely tried to incorporate some of those ideas as well. And then finally, the CLF is working on a version two benchmarking study uh, um, as well. So just wanted to highlight some of these uh, current developments as well to place it all in context. Um, let's jump into Q&A now. Yeah, there's there's one uh, question that's come up a few times here, starting with Jeremy at the very beginning. Uh, Sandra's brought this up as one. Well. I think Lucho just brought brought this up recently. Where so, so Jeremy's question is: Is there any mitigation of the risk of projects specifying a low carbon product but actually having a higher carbon alternate installed? Um, and then Sandra's asking about the verification validation process: How you will ensure that the model building materials will be used? Um, is there like a quality control, quality assurance process in place that we can make sure that it is what it was modeled to be in the in the LCA? Um, so right now we are mostly focused on the design and building permit process. Uh, we rely on the uh, professional uh, team on like the, the basically uh, the certified professionals that are involved in the project, but we are also exploring how we can ensure that what it is proposed will uh, be committed to be in included in the in the uh, final construction. Um, and one thing that we are looking at is, of course, specs and how uh, if if a project would like to claim reduce emissions for a specific product, they need to or a low carbon alternative, they need to spec it and then also make sure that they do not allow um, either alternatives or they would only accept alternative with similar global warming potential or say say they would set a limit for the total of that um, material. So again, um, this is something to be developed, but right now we are mostly focusing on submissions on building permit. And again, uh, we are asking, we are allowing for uh, additional reports. So if a project is claiming that they're using low carbon, we would like them to show us how they are ensuring that that is going to be used in their construction. There is um there's a question by Melvin. I'm not sure if it was if I'm clear on whether what the answer is here, but pH ribbon. I saw it on the Anthony, you had it on the left slide, part nine, not in that box of like tools that are often used for part three. Is pH ribbon allowed like an allowable tool for compliance? I know it's generally part nine, but can be used. Uh I would just say that we haven't looked into that specifically yet. I, I think we probably need to discuss internally. I know they're they're referencing EC3 data points, so that's a possibility. Um mm -hmm. Maybe we'll get. Back. Yeah, I just don't want to make a spot judgment right now on the call. But yeah, uh, yeah, I think we'll we'll look into that. Right. Yeah, we can definitely look into it. And I think something that the the design report says we are allowing tools other than those common ones. Uh, but then we would want to make sure that the, the databases are compliant with the main standards. Mm, that specific tool, we can definitely look at it and see if it, we should just add it and remove the burden on the applicant. Anthony, was there anything in the chat that uh, jumped out at you? Oh, uh, sorry. There's so much going on right now. There is. Uh, um, if anybody, just a, a reminder, if anybody wants to uh, raise their hand and just like participate in the in the discussion here at the end, uh, by all means, you can. Uh, we'll just yeah, just you unmute yourself uh, yeah. or raise your hand and then unmute. <laughs> and then we'll yeah. uh, there, there's also a, a topic about qualification here, uh, and Patrick answered it um, for the most part. I think it's. Right now, there's no, the city of Vancouver does not dictate who can actually perform the whole building LCA. Anybody can do it. Well, yeah, not at the moment. It's a, it's an evolving field. So right now there is no like um, uh, entity that that certifies um, whole building LCA professionals for the building industry. So they, mm -hmm. they, yeah. And I think, I, I mean, I don't know uh, if, I'll just pause, but if there's nothing, I would also wanted to talk a little bit about that whole deconstruction and uh, reuse because sure. there's tons going on. Um, so um, I see that there's lots of uh, comments and I feel free anybody who wants to unmute and uh, share their thoughts. But what I see is the concern on like missing an opportunity by not looking at um, uh, the existing structure on site. And one thing I would say is that, um, and I think Patrick and others actually mentioned it already, 
that we are giving credit when basically a project is reusing an element on site or if it is reusing a salvage and not new element, the emissions for that element is assumed to be zero throughout. So it will, will be excluded, whereas the floor area for that element is included in that we are encouraging uh, reusing. What we are not uh, giving credit is the construction compared to demolition. And the main reason for that is that we do not have good data on that. So even if we, if we include it, it doesn't show a significant uh, advantage. So there are, there are a few areas that we are interested in supporting more studies and collecting more data. One, that one is the construction or uh, maintenance of elements off-site. So if it's not reused on the same site, and then the other one is emissions from construction site. So these these are currently not strong in the tool. So even if they assume it, they wouldn't get much significant advantage from what the tools already have. But again, I, uh, yeah, I think that's also something that we're interested and in. we'll explore to see how we can add it in future. Um. Maybe one thing I'll mention here is that um, there is this this embodied carbon guideline actually was brought up in uh, the carbon exchange that we had recently. Uh, actually, it was the first public presentation, if you will, um, at uh, um, on this topic on this particular guideline. So uh, we were thinking of actually having a further discussion on this potentially at the next carbon exchange in uh, in a few weeks from now. I think it's on the on the nineteenth, if I'm not mistaken, but. If anybody wants to dive a little bit deeper and explore a little bit more, I think there's going to be op an opportunity at that point in time to uh, to carry on the discussion if we run out of time here. Um, Zara, maybe Patrick has answered this question to some uh, to some degree, but uh, Forrest was asking about ways in which the building industry uh, can support the city of Vancouver specifically city council in uh, in moving forward and advancing and making informed decisions on on future embodied carbon limits uh, what what do you what are ways in which the industry can support this um again like you said Patrick uh, somehow responded to that but what we benefit the most at this stage is uh, industry leadership in showing to us how these reduction targets are achieved um, because we knew, we know from studies that are out there that this 10, 20 percent reduction should not have any cost implications. And I think there's a lot of concern in the industry on like whether that would impact the project cost. So I think leadership in, in, in doing such, such projects that we would love to do case studies done and share the knowledge, I think that will go a far way. Um, and of course, supporting it when it goes to the council, but I think more importantly is um, we rely on the industry at the end of the day, these policies and regulations have no value if the, if the industry um, cannot show the leadership that, that these reductions are achievable. Again, like we do know that from case studies and studies and research that is out there, but we would like to have actual projects from Vancouver and, and showcase the success that they have done. I, I would actually add to that, Zara. We're, we're looking, or you may, maybe you mentioned this as well, the cost-effective approaches. And, and this is something that we kind of, we want to really focus on on the case studies that we're developing right now. So, you know, that it is possible. We know it's possible. Uh, but how, what's the impact on cost? And I know for a fact that in, in some of the earlier projects that achieved some impressive carbon, embodied carbon reductions, it was at cost parity. There was no real significant cost increase. That may be changing over time, but I think it's, we want to explore that a little bit in the case studies and showcase, you know, if any of you have projects that you've been able to achieve uh, 10, 20, 30, 40% embodied carbon reductions uh, with at cost parity, that would be wonderful to hear about because uh, that does, uh, I think, enable staff uh, to move forward with some pretty solid recommendations to city council. One more thing I would add is that, again, I think at the end of the day, any leadership, like Anthony mentioned, we, are, we have done our best to allow any project specific or regional specific input in the tools. And the reason is if a project has done something, say on construction site emissions, they can take credit, but we would also like to collect that data and, 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 and build on it, have better baselines, um, identify reduction opportunities on the construction site. So again, 
to Roberto's point, any any project that is doing something great, we would love to support uh, learning from those projects. Yeah, and I just want to jump in. There's also a, a question about interior partitions earlier on. It, it just kind of ties to this point around like, Right now, there's a certain required scope, which is structure and envelope. Actually, in some earlier iterations, we did include interior partitions, and then we took it out. Part of the reason is that we actually wanted to align with, like, for example, the CAGBC Zero Carbon Building Standard or LEED, which currently has a structure and envelope requirement. And so we're trying to align these requirements in some ways, but we also allow for optionally reporting these, right? Inter reporting interior partitions or MEP and all of that. And as we collect more and more data, so I would encourage you, if you are, if you are actually quantifying this and modeling this, uh, maybe it's just uh, voluntarily you're doing it, or maybe you're doing it for other requirements or for owner requirements to please also share that data because that actually really helps with um, uh, often the first steps of developing good policies is is to have some of the good background data as well. So um, there are certain things that are optional right now. Um, and it's not to say that we think it's not important. It's more just like also trying to like how far can we push the envelope right now or, and what's what's uh, reasonable and what can the industry do right now and what things are kind of on the horizon and how do we kind of balance that and also where are the tools going and, and whatnot and so this was a, a giant balancing act of trying to balance like where is the ecosystem at right now and what's the best guidance we can give right now it's not the perfect end all be all but like you know these guidelines will get iterated next year and um so any input that you have as well please do share that uh with sara fill her inbox <laughs> yes. yes please yeah. i would love to hear from yeah Good projects, low cost solutions. Yes. yes. Please send email. <laughs> Don't just come to her with problems. Give her some 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 successes and wins, and as well. right <laughs> or share that with her. <laughs> right. Love to celebrate successes. Yes, for sure. Um, I, there's a there's a comment on on carbon credits. Something I want to add is carbon credits definitely play a role in achieving our like the, the global 2050 climate target. But we think that we have to focus on reducing emissions first before we go to carbon credits and especially embodied carbon, which is such a uh, new thing to consider in design. There is so many hang low hanging fruits that we wanna make sure we address them before moving to um, carbon credits. And I think that's basically the approach in most um, it is. zero carbon plans. It is. It's, uh, we, we, this is something we advocate for all the time, where you want to reduce operational emissions as much as possible. And then you get to the really hard part for existing buildings, for example. And, and then there, at that point, you can use RECs or some kind of offset, to, you know, energy offset um, to bring it down to zero or, you know, whatever you need, you need to call it a zero carbon building performance standard. So I agree. That's, that's the right approach. Okay, I think uh, it's time to maybe wrap it up here. Like I said, um, well, I just first of all, I want to start by thanking uh, Anthony and Zara. So you guys are both extremely busy, and I just wanted to thank you for carving out some time from your really busy schedules to introduce these embodied carbon guidelines to, well, I guess, the entire planet. Um, these are obviously a critical part of the regulation. And I know a lot of work has gone into these, uh, and it looks like, you know, these are shaping up to be like a phenomenal starting point for the guidelines. And I think uh, a lot of people will be following very closely to see what happens with these guidelines in the city of Vancouver. Um, I also wanna thank Patrick Enright, who's in the background here answering half these questions um, and the rest of the supporting crew at the city of Vancouver and, and at Preopt as well uh, for getting these guidelines to such a great starting point. Um, and also all the people that provided input over the past two years across North America. There was a absolutely. lot of comments and inputs. So thank you for helping us iterate yeah. towards uh, yeah, yeah. the guidelines. Yeah. Um, some CLFBC news I just wanted to close with here. So the intake for the 2024 CLFBC Embodied Carbon Awards is about to open uh, in the next, I'm going to say a few days, but let's say next week or so. We have six categories uh, this year. So there's large buildings or small buildings organizational uh, leadership. So there's like one category for governments and nonprofits, another one for like the private sector, if you will, building industry. There's another category for individual leadership um, this year. And then we also have a circularity award. I see a lot of comments in the chat about building reuse and circularity. So hopefully there's projects uh, that people know of that fit the circularity criteria. Um, also coming soon from CLFPC, we have another, like I said earlier, an embodied carbon exchange. I think Ivan just dropped the a link to that exchange in the chat 
we can continue this conversation in one of the breakout rooms for that exchange. Uh, it's on December 19th. It's at noon Pacific. You know, everyone's welcome to come and learn about various aspects of embodied carbon. Uh, it's very casual. It's kind of a free for all, very conversational, not very structured, completely unrehearsed. Um, so we have, like I said, these breakout rooms. Some of them are like embodied carbon 101. Others are like, you know, deep into the weeds kind of technical conversations. It varies quite a bit. Um, and like I said, the most recent one that we had was focused on these embodied carbon guidelines. So that exchange was, those attendees were the first to hear about these guidelines. Uh, the next webinar for CLFBC will be in January. And speaking of the Embodied Carbon Awards, we'll be featuring the 2023 Embodied Carbon Award winner uh, for large buildings. Uh, it's called Discover Montessori. So we're going to be highlighting them in January. So I suggest you sign up to our newsletter to stay up to date uh, on everything I just mentioned. And uh, yeah, that's it. We hope to see you at the Carbon Exchange to carry on this conversation. Thanks, everybody uh, who joined us today. and. Um, Enjoy the rest of the week.